Before we start section 4.3, I wanted to share with you some true false questions that came from sections 4.1 and 4.2, like we've done many times in the past. So I'll give you a moment to pause, capture that, screenshot it, and here come the answers that you'll want to refer to after you've considered each question first. All right. So, section 4.3, what do we got here? Linear, linearly independent sets and bases. Bases is the plural for the word basis, which we will talk about today. But let's remind ourselves what we mean by linearly independent. What makes a set of vectors linearly independent? Well, the first thing we look for is, uh, the, the easy one, is if you notice uh, one vector is a scalar multiple of another one, then it's dependent. So any one vector is not a multiple of another. That keeps it independent. But sometimes uh, that's, that's, that's easy to check if there's just two vectors. Uh, so a, a, a better condition is that any one vector is not a linear combination of the others. Let's look at a few examples to kind of get this back in our head. So I've got a set of two vectors in R2, and we can check by inspection. Clearly, if I multiply the first one by 5, I get 5, but I don't get 11. So since one is not a scalar multiple of the other, this qualifies as independent. So check out this guy. Clearly, the first one scaled by 5 to give me 5 and 10. This gives us a dependent set. So what about a single vector? If you've got a single vector all by itself, it's clearly independent. He's on his own. There is one exception to that. See if you remember before I reveal it. Is there such thing as a single vector that actually is dependent and it turns out this guy, the zero vector by himself, is considered a dependent set. What if the zero vector is part of another set? Well, that makes the whole set dependent because one of these is a scalar multiple of the other. Clearly, you can't scale zero, zero to get one, two, but you can scale one, two to get zero, zero. And so that gives another dependent set. So nothing obvious here at first when it comes to, I don't see any one being a scalar multiple of the other, but I want you to notice right off the bat, we can immediately call this out as a dependent set. And the reason is I have vectors in R2, but I have three vectors. So clearly, the so here's one takeaway is if you have more vectors than each vector has components, you've got a dependent set. So. I know for sure one of these is a linear combination of the other two. This is where things get a little trickier. Clearly, I don't see one being a scalar multiple of another. And uh, I've got three vectors in R3. The question, are these dependent, independent? I don't know. So what do we do in the case like this is we create a three by three matrix, we row reduce it, and you notice something. It turns out if you put those three vectors in, we end up with the identity matrix, which tells me each column has a pivot, which tells me my original set of three vectors, they were independent because of that. All right. So let's move into our world of subspaces. So I've got an example of a subspace in R2, and all that means I've got a collection of vectors, all with two components each, and a subspace is just a span of those vectors. Now, 
just notice those vectors real quick. It won't take you long to notice that they are scalar multiples of the first one. If this got multiplied by negative 3, this got multiplied by 5. So, what's going on here is we have a scenario where, well, what we've got, if you think about spanning this, they all line on the same line. And this line's going through the origin. But the question is, can you think, what would, what, what would be the least amount of vectors we would need to pull off this job? I've got three of them, but I think we can get away with just one. So again, what we have here is a, if we span those three vectors, all this ends up being is a single line through the origin in the direction of any one of those. So what's the least we need to get the job done? We could say this is our basis. The basis for H would just be a single vector. It doesn't matter which one you choose, by the way, but we often choose the one that kind of feels like the most stripped down version. Smallest numbers, no negatives, we like that. So, <clears throat> what would be a basis for all of R2? So if you had to cover the entire plane, well, I guess we would need two vectors. And if you're thinking easy like me, why don't we just go with our elementary vectors, 1, 0, 0, 1. That would clearly get the job done. So those two vectors are a basis for R2. In fact, if we use these, these actually are given the term the standard basis, what most of us would go to if we had to pick two vectors. But doesn't have to be those two. Turns out, if you give me any two vectors in R2, as long as they're not heading in the same direction, that could also serve as a basis. So that's perfectly okay, and we may want to use something like that for some reason. What could be a basis for the set of two by two matrices? Hmm, how could you come up with every matrix that's a two by two? Well, let's think about this. Let's start with the matrix, two by two. Well, if I kind of go along the lines of the standard basis, I guess I would need something like this. Need one of those. And maybe one over in this corner. If you sense where this is heading, that could serve as a basis for every 2x2 two two matrix. And again, we would call this the standard basis because it's clearly created with zeros and ones, but there's it's not the only one. There are many others that could have served. And again, this was my reminder that these are objects called vectors. And so this does qualify as a subspace of the vector space uh, two, of all two by two matrices. All right. So this gives us finally a definition. What is a basis? And all it is, it's the smallest set of vectors needed to span a subspace. So if H is a subspace of a vector space V, then there's two things we know for sure. One, the vectors in H are linearly independent, and the vectors of H have to span all of H. Let's look at two examples. Okay. First one I want to look at. I've given you, uh, looks like a three by four matrix. I've already row reduced it for us. So, again, the question is all about matrix A, but when you row reduce it, things get revealed. So I want you to think, what do we now know about matrix A 
because of my row reduce matrix? Well, I think we can all see there's two pivots in the first two columns. Uh, that means uh, the second ones don't have pivots. So let's call out what we know for sure. It turns out of these, let's, let's think of these column vectors. First of all, I knew they were dependent to begin with. And the reason is there's four column vectors and they were only in R3. So I knew there was a dependency. But it turns out I didn't have three independent vectors. I only had two, and that gets revealed by the pivot columns. So the moment you realize you have a pivot in a column, that column was uh, forms your basis. So just by noticing my row reduced matrix, I now have a basis for the column space of A. And it consists of the first two column vectors. So 1, 0, 5, comma, 0, 1, negative 13. Oh, little uh, online homework note. When you're making a set of vectors, make sure you include that comma in between. It seems silly, but if you don't put it, you'll get an, uh, an error message. So there is the first one I want us to see. So we've got a basis for the column space. Now the one that's going to take a little more effort is I want a basis for the null space of A. Remember what the null space is. It's the set of vectors that get sent to the zero vector. So imagine if you could augment the original matrix, put a bar, we want to know what solutions are there to the homogeneous system. What gets sent to the zero vector? Well, we're going to take this last row reduced matrix and do something very familiar to us. We're going to call out the four variables and I can squeeze that in. I'll we'll go back up here. One, two, three, four. We know four and three are free variables. X2 can be built from those. So I need two x2s minus four x4s. And what else? We've got five x2s minus eight. Oh, sorry. Those are threes. Minus eight x4. Okay. Well, let's unpack that. Let's put this in parametric vector form. I know the solution to the homogeneous system is built from a scaled version. Let's unpack those x3s. We've got 5, 2, 1, 0, x4's turn, negative 8, negative 4, 0, and 1. So it turns out my null space consists of all the linear combinations of these two vectors in R4. So my basis for my null space are these two vectors. Again, I always like to remind you the column space, the subspace is part of R3, and we could have known that just by asking what, how many components are in each column vector. The null space, those vectors are in R4, and you can know that ahead of time by counting how many variables there are, or how many column vectors there are. All right, last example. Find a basis for the set of vectors in R3 in the plane given by this equation. So, huh. So we're finding a basis for a set of vectors in R3. So I know my, my solution, my, my basis vectors will have three components each. Um, what do I know about a plane? Well, it's two dimensional. It looks, we can know ahead of time, I'll probably end up with two vectors in that basis, that's, that's how I'm gonna get a plane to come out of this. And I think the way to think about this is let's think of this one equation as a system of equations. In other words, if I were to put this in a, a 
set it up as an augmented matrix, is what I'm thinking. And let's go with 1, negative 8, 5, augmented with 0. It's already row reduced. There's my pivot. And there's no zeros above or below. Let's call out my solution. Now I'm going to go back to our more familiar variable system. I'm just comfortable with x1, x2, x3, even though it was given x, y, z. And we can see there are two free variables. My x1 is now defined by 8 x2s minus 5 x3s. Putting this in parametric vector form tells me my solution will be x2 scaling 8, 1, 0 plus x3 scaling negative 5, 0, 1. And now we've got it. The question, find a basis for the set of vectors that create this plane. There they are. So my basis is the set of those two guys. And it has the parts we talked about ahead of time. These vectors had to be in R3, three components. Because we were talking about a plane, I knew I'd need two of them in the end.